Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate you joining us. This is The Alternative to Capitalism, a vision for a brighter future and how to get there, hosted by Socialist Action. For those of you who don't know, Socialist Action uh, is a national group of activists who work on all kinds of issues, um, anti-war, anti-racist, labor, feminist, LGBT, environmental issues, and a lot more. <coughs> And uh, essentially, we believe that capitalism, a system of economic and social exploitation that ultimately benefits only a tiny percentage of the wealthy and powerful, is the root cause of these problems. And any lasting solution to them will be built on capitalism's ultimate downfall. Our ultimate goal is to build a truly democratic society organized to satisfy the needs of all people. And we try to bring that perspective to all the struggles we participate in here in New York and nationwide. Uh, as we all know, capitalism as a system is inherently pervasive. It now governs arguably the whole world to the point where most people see it as normal and in fact inevitable. And so it's very important to us that our struggle be international as well. On that note, we have with us today two speakers from France. They are members of the new anti-capitalist party or NPA formed in 2009 out of the Revolutionary Communist League and several other groups who organize based on a broad spectrum of social issues. They are the only political organization that challenged the French ban on solidarity protests with Palestine, and they have faced legal charges for their actions. They have also run in several national elections, but always on a platform that advocates exclusively for change from below and not through existing political institutions. Both our speakers here tonight participate in a minority current of the NPA called Anti-Capitalism and Revolution, which emphasizes workplace and youth activity as a basis for organizing. Our first speaker, Stan Munier, is a full-time activist involved in Paris-based campaigns for the legal legalization of undocumented youth and against police brutality. So dear comrades and friends, in this time a renewed attack of the ruling class on a world scale in the name of austerity, I'm here to bring you some news of the old continent. The situation there is the same than here. Relentless racist attack against minorities, <coughs> cutbacks, school and hospital closures, and people finding themselves homeless. In November of 2014, when a young ecologist militant was murdered by the cops, the name of Ferguson was on all lips, and, even, and everyone could clearly connect the dots and see that police brutality was not only an American phenomenon. The situation in Europe presents some interest, not only because of the violence of the attacks, but also because of the resistance mechanisms it triggered. So the neoliberal era, that is the era of austerity, initiated in the 80s, and the general retreat of the labor movement, weakened already pretty strongly the European idea of a welfare state, dating back from the aftermath of the Second World War. In order to maintain its level of profits in a period of crisis, the program of the European ruling class is clear. To get rid of the remnants of the welfare state in order to finally address the issue of the high labor cost in Europe in the name of the debt. So European workers are accused of having led the high life and having to reimburse their follies. But what, life, what high life are we talking about? Low wages, unemployment, homelessness, poor health, impossibility to pay the bill, struggling to make it ends meet. This is the common lot of the European working class, and I'm sure you guys can relate. The money borrowed by the European states were used to bail out, bail out banks and give tax cuts to the rich, and virtually none of this money was actually used to build schools, roads or hospitals. Not to mention the high interest rates granted to the banks by their cronies. In short, the public debt is actually the private debt of the rich that the rich are making us pay under the false pretense that we're all in the same boat. Let us now enter into the heart of the matter. How the European working class is trying not to pay for the crisis. So in Northern Europe, so that's Germany, Netherlands, Scandinavia and England, an economy faring better to do past neoliberal reforms and the stronger integration of the trade union bureaucracy to the state apparatus pro produced profound demoralization and apathy in the working class. We saw some struggles against austerity, but they were even more isolated and easily defeated than elsewhere. For example, recently, the general strike of train conductors in Germany or the strike of public employees against cutbacks in England a few years ago. At the opposite, you have Southern Europe and Ireland, where austerity is hitting the hardest and where the social movements were not destroyed in the past. There were at least in Greece, Spain, and Portugal huge days of general strike called by the unions, so several million people taking to the streets, and trace-based local strikes, like the teacher strike in Greece and the movement against precarious work in Portugal, sometimes with self-managed factory, like Viome in northern Greece and Rimaflo in Italy, 
There are also very radical movements outside of the workplace. So against the, uh, the opening of polluting gold mines in the north of Greece, uh, near Thessaloniki, so a place where most youth have left already uh, because there's no job there. So you saw 60 and 70 year old women uh, actually throwing Molotov cocktails at the cops, which even for us Europeans <laughs> is a clearly uncommon sight. But most of these struggles uh, uh, led to defeat. You had a few tiny exceptions in Spain where uh, at the same time workers and also um, the population, the community were able to stop hospital closures in the region of Madrid. But apart from that, most of the struggles were uh, led to defeat. So the grip of the trade union bureaucrats uh, who organized these days of general strike uh, is still fierce. And they clearly um, called th for these days of general strike only for people to vent their anger and not really to challenge um, austerity. And uh, coupled with this uh, austerity attacks, you can see strong attack on democratic rights, women rights, and minorities that are being waged by the ruling class in order to both repress and divide working people. But my comrade will elaborate on that. So on the electoral level, there is no st still no rise of the far left. But in southern Europe, there are a few interesting <coughs> developments one has to take into account. So especially in Greece and Spain, you had a combination of two factors. Traditional political parties were a bit discredited. Uh, because they had implemented austerity, whether they were left-wing party or center-left or right-wing parties. So uh, at the same time, you had the combination of uh, strong struggle and also of the inability of the ruling class to solve its own crisis. Because what the ruling class does is that with layoffs and employment, they actually cut the purchasing power of workers. And then workers are unable to consume any kind of goods, which uh, it's kind of the snake biting his own tail. Um, so from these two, um, from these two, um, from the two things happening, um, you had uh, traditional political parties were discredited. So let, first, let's take a look at Greece. So Greece has been among the countries hardest hit by the crisis. The general, uh, the gross domestic product has dropped 30 percent between 2009 and 2015, and the bosses are making the workers pay for the bill. So uh, one has to understand that in Southern Europe, you have two phases of the crisis. So first, the general crisis that you guys also experienced starting in 08. And since 2010, uh, you had the crisis of the public debt. So you had a combination of factors. Um, the fact that all this money, like I talked about before, uh, was put to bail out banks and big business. Also, you had countries that since the Second World War had been over-specialized in one <coughs> trade or two, like tourism and construction, which makes them vulnerable to uh, any kind of economic turmoil. Uh, so this over-specialization was even strengthened uh, after the entry in the Eurozone. And also, you have um, very uh, archaic elements. For example, in Greece, uh, the richest capitalists were the shipbuilders, uh, and the richest landowner, which is the Orthodox Church, they pay simply no taxes at all. They pay 0.000% of taxes. So you had um, these, so austerity was implemented first uh, by the right wing, then by the coalition of the, cent of the right wing of the conservatives and of uh, the socialist party, so the center left. Um, but these were uh, only scattered days of general strike and they weren't able to really change austerity. But what happened is that you had the whole section of the electorate of the socialist party who decided not to trust them anymore because they said they are the party, they are the servants basically of the European banks and European Union. So they decide to switch their allegiance to Syriza, which is a, a small uh, left of the left <coughs> organization, which was a Euro-communist split from the 80s, with its young leader, Alexis Tsipras, promising to resist European Union. So actually, uh, what happened is that when they came into power, they had huge promises for the people, and they weren't able to fulfill the, these promises, uh, because um, at the same time, they wanted to content European bankers and also the population, but with no plan whatsoever to actually mobilize the population. If you kind of do a little exercise of political fiction, you say, okay, let's say the government say, we have, we're going to raise wages. So then the European banks are going to say, we're not going to give you any money uh, because you have to pay the debt first. And that's the only, um, the only thing you have to abide by is to pay the debt. And if the, if the Greek government says, fuck that, we're not going to pay the debt, uh, then they're simply going to run out of money. So if you wanted to actually oppose uh, European Union and stuff, you need uh, to have a plan to seize the assets of all Greek capitalists, seize the land, 
uh, have uh, workers uh, get a say in the workplace in how to organize stuff. And Syriza basically didn't have this plan of general mobilization. So they fell in front of the European banks and they basically gave in to the demand of the European Union. And now you have also um, kind of a drawback of this general stuff is that there is very strong nationalism and chauvinism developing in Greece. Uh, instead of saying the culprits of the crisis are the European banks or French and German banks, they're actually blaming it on the German people. Um, and, be, and you have um, uh, some fractions of the Greek ruling class who are kind of thinking about it. And even though the main plan of the, of the Greek ruling class <coughs> is to stay to, is stick together with the European ruling class, a larger fraction of them is saying, we're already exporting and importing in very strong relationship to the Balkans. Now you had the Coca-Cola factory that closed in Thessaloniki. It opened in Bulgaria. All the milk that was used for the main uh, dairy producer of Greece that came from Epirus, which is a region closer to Albany, now it comes from Bulgaria. So part of the Greek capitalists are saying, OK, if we're kicked out of the European Union, we can actually make it by exploiting the shit out of the Balkans. Um, so and in the background, you have very strong nationalism developing even among Greek people. So this is the kind of pressure the left has to cope with. And we'll see how um, this whole thing plays out. So the question is, is there more hope in Spain? So we had the same kind of phenomena. Traditional parties were discredited. As in Greece, you had social movements. But um, unlike Greece, you had um, Spanish workers were able to secure more wins. And actually, there weren't any real political parties on the left that could benefit from it. But actually, you had a party almost sprung out from zero, from um, Pablo Iglesias. So there was a host of a TV show uh, called The Bolt, which was uh, denouncing the corruption of the elites of the country, and a small uh, Trotsky's group. So if you, uh, these, um, it's, it's hard to tell how much, but actually, you had thousands and thousands of people joined the local circles, circles of Podemos or Circulos. Uh, the party was created in January 2014. Uh, and so all of these people were people who had fight, fought against hospital closures, trade unionists, uh, youth, because if you uh, take into account the real unemployment of the youth in Spain, it goes as high as 50%. Most northern Europe cities are actually filled with young Spanish migrants. Some of them had a degree in computer science in Madrid, but in uh, Paris or Amsterdam, they are maids in hotels. Uh, so this youth, this whole movement, uh, joined up. But then, as with Syriza, uh, as the stakes became higher and higher, new questions arose. Uh, when the, the party barely exists, is something different than when you are able to score as high as 20% in the election. And then you have to ask yourself the question, the stuff that Erika was saying before, powers from below or power from above. Should we facilitate coalition with existing party, or should we try to do things on our own that's going to be based on worker and people's mobilization? So now um, there's an ongoing discussion in Spain as to what um, can happen in this situation. And there's going to be um, regional elections in the month of June and national elections in the month of December. And then Podemos will show a true face. What will the leadership do? And what will the base of the organization do? In case um, the leadership is unable to fulfill its promises, then will uh, the mass of the people that constitute the organization be able to take the stuff, the stuff one step forward? So France is somewhere in between uh, northern and southern Europe. So um, you had austerity in the 80s that was implemented, but nowhere as brutal as Reagan or Thatcher, for example. And also, uh, unlike the economies of southern Europe, the French economy is much stronger and diversified. So um, France has a GDP of, uh, uh, of around $3 trillion, which is 50% higher than Italy and more than two times bigger than Spain's. So since the beginning of 2009, there were lots of fights and strikes against layoff in and uh, fights against business closure in France. So auto parts suppliers, car manufacturers, book and disc sellers, retail, all sectors were impacted, whether manufacturing or services. So the rhetoric of the bosses is always the same. We do not have any kind of money to invest. The bank vault is empty. We need to downsize, even though we know they have been piling up money for years. But the problem of this struggle is that they remain isolated and humanity, they fail to achieve their primary, uh, their primary goal, which was to keep the business open. So we had one <coughs> strike of the auto parts supplier, tire manufacturer Continental, in 2009, where you had 1,100 workers who went for a six-month strike and were able to get up to 100, 120,000 euros in severance pay, which is better than nothing, 
the, oh, they, they, they should have been getting tw uh, 1,200. So they multiplied it tenfold, but they didn't manage to keep the business open because you would have needed to have a general um, uh, concerted efforts of many trade unionists and many finding businesses in order to achieve that effect. So, uh, and the problem is that only revolutionaries fight for this kind of the, tr uh, of the coordination. So my comrade will elaborate on that, but in, since 2012, we have um, a center-left government and we have to face what the Americans face a lot, the evils of lesser evilism. People will say that um, if we fight against the government, if we fight against the socialist party, the center-left, which is abiding by none of the promises they make, then we are strengthening the far right. And this has been the main excuse for the trade union bureaucracy not to do anything, because if we fight against the government of the left, like they would say here, don't fight Obama, because Obama is on our side, even though he's not really say, doing what he's supposed to be doing. So uh, we had several uh, movements take place. My uh, comrade will elaborate on that. I will uh, talk about my personal experience as an organizer for the undocumented youth. So about the undocumented youth. So in France, uh, the law says that if you are under 18, whether you are foreign or uh, national born, you're supposed to be taken care of by the state. So all your needs have to be taken care of of the state, whether housing, school, food, transportation, health, and everything. So what the child services in my city, in the city of Paris did, is that they invented many ways of evaluate uh, one's age that are completely arbitrary and that allow them to flush out uh, thousands and thousands of youth. For example, they're gonna do a, uh, someone who's not even a social worker, sometimes someone with a background in law, is gonna do a 30 minute interview with a youth and tell him, oh, your speech, uh, what you're saying makes too much sense. You cannot be a minor. Uh, then they're gonna do a bone structure test. So these tests were invented when someone has a developmental issue, you make the, text, the test in order to, um, to evaluate what kind of, what course of treatment should be pursued. But actually they're using this test to determine the age, even though French and European courts uh, have ruled that these tests are completely inefficient. Uh, and also what they're gonna do is that they're gonna ask the kids to bring all their documents in, uh, but they have the obvious intent of declaring them false anyway. So because this, of this exclusion machine, you had thousands and thousands of youth were let out in the street of France and what basically no rights and nothing. So a coalition formed and we were able to uh, organize the kids for four months, so between December of 2014 and now. So um, the kind of uh, politics we defended, one was that the kids should self-organize. That uh, the only way that um, the struggle goes until the end is that the first people who are armed by, the me by these measures are the first one to decide and to fight against them. So one was self-organization, and the other one was we're not gonna take any backroom de deals with city hall and child services. Either it's all of the kids or not at all. And that um, the, um, the city is obviously breaking the law, and child services are obviously breaking the law, so we're gonna make them abide by the law, by our mobilization. So we occupied the building of child services for a few hours um, before being uh, thrown out. Uh, one of the stuff that gave the push to this is that you had one kid, so most of the kids are from West Africa or Afghanistan, like 50-50. One of the kids was from Ivory Coast and his parents had sent him to be a construction worker in, uh, in Morocco. So basically, uh, he didn't work to work construction, so his boss uh, beat him up in the eye. Uh, so he came in the office of church services every day for two months with a band-aid and ooze coming out of it, and they didn't even tell him anything ever. So when we were the coalition met him, we went to the hospital and they had to take out his eye. And that was one of the stuff that gave us a big push for the occupation, is that, um, and so um, the, we're suing City Hall for that case, and uh, actually they're saying, oh, like, maybe we made a mistake, uh, maybe there's some deals to be cut, uh, but this kind of case is not the exception, it's the norm. So in four months, so we did square encampments, uh, some stuff you became familiar with, with Occupy, I guess. So we occupied the main square of the city, and basically um, we, we, raised, uh, we raised hell in the whole city because like, C Paris City prides itself in being a welcoming place to the tourist. So if you're a rich American tourist and you show up in the main square of the city and you see 200 or 300 black people like, camping out in the street, it kind of ruins your vacation. So uh, basically before, because of all this bad press, we managed to bring about the city, 
uh, they uh, gave in to the housing demand. So we managed the 43 kids that were in the struggle, we managed to put them up in like emergency unit or something. So um, now we are, there's a new fight for them to go to school because the Board of Education basically said yes and then you're retracted. So we work with trade unions and community organizations to make them abide by their promise. So uh, before letting my comrade elaborate on all sorts of different struggles, uh, I want to say the two conclusions <coughs> I draw from my own experience as an organizer in this period of turmoil is that first, revolutionaries cannot only be the people who talk the talk. They have to be the people who walk the walk. So struggles are complicated. There are many aspects that may frighten us or drive us away. So having to wage the fight against the far right or against the trade union bureaucracy for the leadership of the struggle. But we have to take risks both as individual and organization, otherwise we are just plain useless. On the, on the other hand, we have to maintain class independence. It does, just, it does not mean we wait for a mobilization to be chemically pure uh, to go into the battlefield, but we have to have a clear speech. Like many workers may be tempted out by reformism, new or old, some by lesser evilism, and we have to be able to say to people, I understand why you think what you think, but I believe you're wrong, I will show you in practice. And this is the second point I want to make. Um, I've been on a, in the tour, I was in Philadelphia a few days ago, um, and we had an interesting discussion. So a young activist from the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, I wouldn't say the other panelists were old, but I would say some of them went through politics in the civil rights era. Uh, so they were talking about this period of struggle and the guy was like even younger than me was 21 He said, okay, I believe what you say about the civil rights how cool it was But tell me something I can relate to and that's why we need uh, every partial Every portion and every small uh, victory we need because then we gave people something they can relate to uh, Because people like if you tell them that capitalism sucks, they're gonna tell you tell me something I don't know they know they cannot pay the bills at the end of the month. They know they can't make ends meet. Uh, so if you just speak in a general way, they will say, I agree with you, but I have to put food on the table, pay the mortgages and everything. And that's why we need these um, victories, however modest, however partial they may be. So um, I want to thank you again for inviting me to speak. Uh, for us, it's also an opportunity to learn about the movements uh, in America. Um, and li like I said, like people tend to fantasize over Europe, how cool it is there, but I think you guys are fighting the most ruthless, violent, and unprincipled ruling class in the world. Uh, the kind, uh, we're gonna talk about it afterwards, we had a comrade who might go to jail for two months because he was indicted falsely of being assaulted a police officer. And the comrade there told me that dozens of youth in California face, face life in jail for the same issue. So you guys are pretty brave in fighting that kind of repression. So thank you. Next we have uh, another speaker who also joins us from France, also from the new anti-capitalist party there, uh, Gabriel Lafleur. He's a railroad worker in Paris, a grassroots unionist, and a member of the national leadership of the NPA and its anti-capitalism and revolution current. Hi to everyone. Hello to everyone, so I'm Gabriel. I work in uh, one of the big train stations in Paris, the Gare Saint-Lazare, for those who, uh, who know it. Um, and also an activist in uh, the NPA, who, uh, as you said, were, was created a few years ago as a new experience of a broad anti-capitalist party uh, with a debate from the start uh, as to whether it should be more strategically defined and uh, uh, more revolutionary, even if not completely uh, uh, achieved uh, as a, in terms of strategy or a more broad anti-neoliberal and uh, with no specific strategy. And so we are, uh, that's why uh, Stan and, and, and I, we are in the, in the current uh, who thinks it should be more specific on uh, how to get to, to our goal. And that's what I'm going to, to try to explain is that uh, the strategy we, we want to put forward is not one that includes mostly uh, elections and uh, uh, institutional change but change from below, social movement strikes, and as it happens, there are some in France and in other parts of the world who, on which we can rely on. So to, to start, a quick word about the general sit political situation in France. Uh, as Stan explained, we are in the middle of the crisis still in, in general in Europe, which is something like a weak link in the world uh, chain, maybe, because the, as a political structure, it's very weak with no homogeneous uh, goals. 
we still have different bourgeois class in each European country who have different interests, who, different strategies, both uh, internationally and also uh, nationally because the, the neoliberal agenda hasn't been uh, achieved the same way in all these countries. Uh, for example, in England, it's been achieved very early. <coughs> in Germany, it happened around 2003 with the Schroeder uh, Social Democrat government. But in France, uh, we are very much uh, late compared to, to these countries. And so it was the, the main task of uh, the Sarkozy government and now the Hollande government to, uh, to go very fast, not to be uh, completely lost in the, in the race. And so that's the, the main element of uh, this new government, is that there was a huge hope in, uh, many, for many people to uh, uh, get, get uh, Sarkozy away and uh, thinking that politics would be a little different. And it is not very different, but the little difference that exists is that the new government with Hollande is a lot more aggressive than what Sarkozy was. They dare uh, reforms that Sarkozy wouldn't have dared. And they, what they're trying to do is to represent, I guess, something like the Democratic Party here, try to be the best uh, political ally of the boss union, which has always been in France the right wing. But now they're trying to be even more, uh, more pro-boss uh, pro party than, than the right wing, and which means uh, they, they privatize a lot, they, uh, make, uh, they organize a complete shift in the use of tax. Uh, the, now the, the people who are actually taxed are the workers, and the people who actually benefit from the tax are now the, the biggest uh, uh, companies. Uh, it's like a, a direct transfer of uh, riches, which used to be something like the opposite, try and uh, limit the, the damages and possibilities of explosion through taxation. Uh, we, it's now exactly the, the, the contrary. And not only do they uh, give money to the boss, but also they repress a lot. Uh, Stan talked about it, but we have uh, several comrades of the NPA right now who are facing either jail time or uh, layoffs, thanks to a disciplinary uh, repression. Uh, donc one uh, was the a comrade who uh, uh, was the official organizer of the uh, Palestine Solidarity demonstration this summer. And because he signed the paper proposing uh, that the demonstration would go from place A to place B, which was refused by the, the authority, he didn't even participate in the demonstration, knowing it, it could be uh, uh, dangerous for him. But still, because he had signed the demand, he, he faced uh, uh, jail time. In the end, after a huge uh, support campaign, the charges were dropped, and so he, he went free. But we have another comrade who participated in a demonstration in the south of France, in Toulouse, because a, a few months ago, there was a project for uh, building a huge dam uh, that would have destroyed a whole uh, valley. Uh, and so there was an ecological and social uh, fight against this dam, with an uh, important demonstration and pretty radical means too, and a huge repression by the state who actually killed one of the demonstrators in a <coughs> who wasn't even uh, armed or uh, uh, threatening. He was uh, actually a pacifist ecologist, but he happened to be in the demonstration and he received uh, an offensive, uh, not offensive, a grenade, I don't know, <laughs> like, a, like war material, and, and he was killed. And so the next week there were demonstrations in solidarity with this and against the, this killing. And our comrade was uh, like recognized by a cop as having participated in this demonstration. And uh, he's facing now two months uh, in jail for uh, participating in a banned demonstration. And the third one is a, a, post, uh, a post worker and a unionist who organized, who was one of the organizers of uh, one of the biggest strikes in the postal workers in France, a six month strike last year that won in the western suburb of Paris. And he's now, uh, he's been laid off because he's accused of having talked to uh, people, to co-workers, in another workplace than his. Uh, and it happened like two weeks after the Charlie uh, freedom of speech uh, happening. And, and so he, he's now uh, out of work. And we are doing a campaign uh, to, to put him back. And it happened with the obvious participation of the government, who has a, a huge influence in the, the postal uh, uh, company. So all these examples to say that people hoped that the government would at least be a little less aggressive than the previous. It's quite the opposite, in fact. Also in terms of a war, 
because they, they waged more wars than Sarkozy. Uh, France is now uh, invading Mali uh, a, few, a few months ago. They are uh, intervening in several countries in Africa and uh, in the Middle East. Also, it's uh, in terms of uh, racism. It's uh, quite a, a surprise for uh, many uh, left activists who thought that even if it was still a neoliberal left, at least they weren't racist or not as much racist. And now there is a competition the, with the, the previous right-wing government. And Valls, the Prime Minister, and Hollande are actually proud of uh, exp uh, that they're deporting. Uh, deporting more uh, foreign people than the, the previous government. It's like the subject of actual pride in the, the TV shows. And yesterday we had the results of a long-standing uh, trial uh, for what happened in 2005. Maybe you heard of this at the time. There was a huge revolt in the French suburbs with a lot of uh, cars being burnt and mass demonstration. What was presented uh, uh, outside as a, a civil war, I think. I remember seeing Fox News uh, uh, about that. And the two cops who chased the, the young people and which le le led to uh, their death have just been uh, freed of all charges and the, the last uh, judiciary uh, procedure was uh, finished yesterday uh, and they, they've been uh, acquitted once again with a strong influence of the government. So that's all the, the situation we have uh, and it's a pretty uh, shitty one obviously also because all these hopes that people had in the government have been deceived and the direct uh, <coughs> consequence of this is that people tried the right wing, it was, uh, didn't work. People tried what they call the left wing, it didn't work. So who do they turn to? The, the, the far left is not strong enough and doesn't have enough uh, influence today to, be, to appear as a potential uh, uh, solution. So they turn to the National Front and the right wing, who is now the, the biggest party in France in terms of uh, election. It doesn't uh, correspond to a, a huge uh, social implementation and day-to-day -day -day influence. But it's still a, a huge threat, obviously. <laughs> and the more the government is doing the, the boss uh, union politics, the more uh, the, right, the, the, the far right is, uh, is developing. And also, not only as a traditional uh, far right, having a huge emphasis on racism and anti-Islam, anti-immigration, but there are also new currents of the far right uh, who try and actually manage more or less to implement in the suburbs, in the immigrant c communities, and the, uh, the, the, the working class, uh, and whose main uh, ideology today is uh, conspiracy theories and anti-Semitism. And they are actually winning uh, an influence that's uh, becoming quite a, a threat even for, uh, for activists in, the, in these communities. So that's general overview of the, the situation. I think hopefully we have big struggles against that. And th there is not a, a passive, uh, 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 working, the working class is not completely passive f facing this. We've had, as uh, Stan said in 2009, the first wave of struggles against the crisis with uh, several uh, car, car factories struggling against uh, factory closures. And it had a strong national, nationwide uh, impact, even if the, the, the struggles didn't win. At the same time, <coughs> we had a general strike in uh, Guadeloupe in the French West Indies, who uh, was a complete general strike for uh, several days, and who won. And it's at that, that moment that we founded the NPA. It was in a, a pretty uh, favorable situation. Uh, then the next day, the next year, we had a strong uh, strike against the pension reform. That was the last uh, big reform of uh, the Sarkozy era, but it lost. And we've had uh, three or four years that were more complicated afterwards because the, the, it was a real defeat and the struggle existed but very scattered. And we are uh, still pretty much in this situation, but it's be beginning to change because we've had recently several big struggles uh, and nationwide. Uh, today, this very day in France, is the one of the first very big, uh, what we call the national education uh, uh, system. I don't know if it's the, the same which is a, a only a one uh, public, publicly organized uh, education system. A uh, big strike that is more than 50% strikers nationwide. It's, been, it's the first time in, uh, in several years against uh, a new education reform by the, the government who's trying to uh, uh, break the national framework of diploma and trying to uh, organize a competition between uh, every uh, high school and uh, uh, college, comment tu dis? Junior high. And junior high 
uh, in terms of value of the diploma. The, the value would depend on the neighborhood you are in, which uh, exists, I guess, here and in many countries, but didn't exist that much in France uh, until now. Um, and also we had, uh, uh, this last few months, a lot of strikes on, on the, question, the issue of uh, wages, which is pretty new in the situation, because uh, it means that at least this part of the, the working class are not as afraid as they were until a few months ago to lose their job, and, which mean, and now they are uh, getting ready to fight for uh, better working conditions and better wages, which means a more self-confidence than uh, uh, waiting until the, your factory is threatened of, uh, of closure. And uh, we also had a, a big movement a uh, year and a half ago in Brittany, in the, uh, the west of France, that was called the Red Hat Movement, um, which started uh, against uh, closures in the, and layoffs in the agroalimentary uh, in the industry, meatpacking meat okay, industry, um, but with the very strange uh, aspect that it was from the start uh, something mixed in class, in terms of class, because it was uh, partly a common uh, struggle of workers and their boss who were claiming to be victims of the, the competition with uh, the, re the rest of the of, uh, European countries. And so there has been from the start a strong ideological battle in this movement between the boss and the far right who wanted to, to do a, like a nationalist uh, worker strike and the far left who are, who are struggling to organize uh, uh, just uh, workers' uh, uh, demands and around the wages and uh, the, the for to forbid the uh, layoffs. And so there was a, it was one of the first time in a, in a long time that within the same movement, the, the two uh, contradictory class interests uh, expressed. Usually it was a di in, in different place, different times, but this was a, the, the very same demonstrations. And it, it, uh, it shows the, um, the contradiction of the situation in France today and also the contradiction that exists in people's mind because of the left-wing government politics and the, the loss of uh, uh, compass that uh, m many people experience over, over the last years. And last but not least in terms of examples, the, the big railroad worker strike that happened uh, last year, uh, which I was uh, a part of, it happened because what the right wing hadn't done before the left wing, uh, the left government tried to do, which was to uh, uh, advance radically in the privatization of the national company uh, of trains. Uh, today there is still no uh, competition in trains. There is a public monopoly, uh, except for the freighters who, who, who are more and more private, but for the transportation of uh, people, uh, we still have a, a public monopoly and they, they try to end it and uh, scatter the national company into uh, three different companies. One who would be uh, responsible for the infrastructure and the uh, the co conductor, I guess that's how you say it, the people who uh, uh, draw the itineraries of the, the trains and change the uh, uh, les aiguilles. The okay, com too complicated. Tracks. The tracks, okay. <laughs> uh, and so that would be the, the costly aspects and they would remain public and the whole uh, people transportation and the train operating part who can be actually, uh, who can bring uh, profits would be privatized little by little and that's the, the old uh, uh, motto of uh, neoliberalism, to uh, privatize the profits and to nationalize the, the, the loss, that's it. Um, and the second aspect of the reform was to, um, uh, was very aggressive against the working condition of the railroad workers, who, uh, who are, we are one of the last uh, strongholds, let's say, of the workers' movement in France, something maybe like the Teamsters or the longshoremen here, uh, who uh, and we we there has been a lot of strikes in the previous years to maintain the, what we call the statue status and the the, the working condition uh, that 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 we have. Who uh, until now limited accidents also because uh, when a railroad worker is uh, too tired to uh, be uh, focused on his work, uh, it results in uh, obviously in, uh, in accidents. Uh, and so they are trying to uh, make us work more hours every every day, with more flexible uh, time, uh, lesser uh, uh, time to uh, to sleep, more more worker work days in the whole year, 
uh, and all this for uh, obviously the, the same wage. And so th this will be the second part of the reform. There will be a second round next year, and that's why this struggle has been so important, because we didn't win against the, the, the scattering of the company, so the, the reform passed. But it was a very big uh, like repetition for us, a rehearsal for the, the next uh, movement, who touches even more directly the railroad workers, because they, they can feel concerned about the structure of the company, but they feel obviously more concerned about their own working conditions, and that will be uh, next year. And, and so we've done a, a, a 10 days national strike, which was a, a majority strike, uh, out of a 165,000 uh, strong company, which was, it was really a, a huge strike, with a lot of uh, young uh, railroad workers who were active for the first time in their strike, because until now, most strikes were, uh, like, strikers were at home uh, all the, for all the, the time of the strike, and this time, uh, it was not big enough still, but uh, we had a, a, an important part of the work of the strikers who became who came every day to the workplaces to organize picket line demonstration to go and see uh, workers in other uh, sectors. For example, we've had uh, strong links with the six months long uh, postal worker strike that I I talked about. Uh, we organized common uh, actions, also with uh, another national strike that happened at the time, who was the people who work in theaters and the movies. Uh, who, uh, whose status was uh, threatened too. Um, and but we, there was also obstacles, obviously, uh, mostly the uh, union leadership who tried to organize a very passive uh, strike, as they always do, saying that they, they would uh, negotiate instead of the, of the workers. They, they knew how to do, they were specialists, and uh, uh, people should rely on them. So there has been a very strong fight uh, within the movement uh, between the, the grassroots uh, workers and the, the bureaucracy. And in my uh, station, in uh, Garçon Lazare, we managed to organize uh, to, to beat them from the, the second day. And every day we had votes where uh, the bureaucrats voted, uh, where five to vote for the, their propos proposals, where, the, where uh, the, the whole rest of the General Assembly, 185, voted against and for other proposition which made uh, something of a chemically pure uh, uh, distinction between the bureaucracies and the, and the, the radical uh, strikers. And we managed to uh, organize a really democratic strike with the general assemblies every day uh, who decided everything. And also to call for a, a coordination of the general assemblies in, the ho in every uh, Paris station so that it wouldn't be only the union uh, officials who would control the, the links and the uh, uh, the city-wide uh, demonstration, uh, and we we managed to organize it, but it was already too late. The the strike was beginning to decline, and so just to uh, to conclude, um, what we draw from from all this, the political situation and the example of struggles, is that uh, there are there are huge obstacles. Obviously, people are getting uh, poorer. Uh, there are some are, are losing their jobs. The reform and attacks by the government uh, succeed. Uh, the 90% of the time. That's the given. But what's pretty new uh, and must be a, a strong focus for us is that there are also possibilities in this situation. Uh, not anytime, anywhere, but victories exist and uh, they mostly exist thanks to a revolutionary or radical activist who uh, actually defend a different way to strike uh, than what the bureaucracies uh, do. Um, and we, it happened with the postal strike and with a few, a few other examples. And we think it's a, our key role uh, as revolutionary activists is to focus on these uh, examples and to uh, uh, get the necessary uh, influence and implementation to organize ourselves strikes this way and links between the, the different sectors. Um, and so we think it's uh, possible even here. For, I, I don't know enough the, the situation <coughs> in the States, but from what I read uh, the previous years, uh, the CTU strikes, for example, in Chicago made a lot of noise. And uh, well, I guess victories are possible uh, in, in different countries. And we just have to uh, organize and uh, draw the, the right conclusions. Our uh, last speaker is Jeff Mackler. Um, a lot of you already 
are familiar with Jeff, but um, I'll just give him a quick introduction. Uh, he's um, a member of the Administrative Committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition, or <coughs> UNAC, which um, actually just last week in New Jersey organized a big conference that attracted about 400 people. Um, he is the California-based director of the Mobilization to Free Mumia Abu-Jamal, former West Coast coordinator of the Lynn Stewart Defense Committee. He is a, lifetime, a lifelong activist and has authored many books and pamphlets on a variety of social justice issues. And of course, he is the current National Secretary of Socialist Action. Well, unlike these older people, the youth prefer to stand. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming, and <clears throat> thank you especially for Stan and, and Gabriel, our co-thinkers in Europe, who also discussed the situation in Greece, where our young comrades are uh, fighting against the same kind of austerity that we face <clears throat> in the United States. Uh, Stan made a comment which stood out in my mind when he said many young people understand that capitalism is failing. <clears throat> in fact, when um, we spoke at the Philadelphia Forum on our way here, five young comrades uh, were so impressed with our description of capitalism and the fact that the day before we spoke to 500 people who were commemorating the 30th anniversary of the bombing of the MOVE headquarters, which destroyed an entire city block and killed 15 blacks that uh, they expressed an interest on the spot in joining socialist action, which was very good. And we had a similar <clears throat> positive response when we moved on to Connecticut. In fact, the polls show, a recent Pew poll, that 55% of all black youth under 30 prefer socialism over capitalism. Although the Pew organization, like the Gallup poll, didn't define what socialism is. And among white youth, the figure was 46% prefer socialism over capitalism, and 44% prefer capitalism, uh, capitalism over socialism. So in other words, there's a deep anti-capitalist sentiment in the United States. But unlike in past radicalizations of consciousness, <clears throat> today, this change of consciousness and openness to socialist ideas comes from the U.S. and worldwide crisis of capitalism that has no modern day solution. So, for example, <clears throat> in December, the United Nations is sponsoring a conference of parties, the 21st, so they call it COP21, to deal with the question of global warming. And every one of the participating nations has stated in advance that they have no proposals whatsoever to prevent the planet Earth from reaching a two degree increase in centigrade temperature, which is the scientifically agreed point beyond which that the catastrophic consequences to the entire planet are irreversible. So there are plans to protest the fact that no capitalist nation on Earth has any solution to impending doom. In fact, the opposite of the case. The uh, former head of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, announced in his book of a few years ago that the United States fully intends to increase the production of fossil fuels by 40% in the next 25 years, rather than reduce it by 90% in the next 10 years, which is a prerequisite for the survival of the planet. There are literally three, four trillion dollars of fossil fuels in the ground today that have been recently discovered and the ruling classes have decided that it is necessary to exploit those <clears throat> and essentially ignore global warming, the consequences of which we've already seen. Another expression of this is endless wars, like Stan described, 
over the very fuel whose continued use spells doom for humankind. So if you look behind the formal headlines in the Ukraine, the Ukraine has, the eastern Ukraine has the largest shale oil resources in the world, reserves in the world. And the United States intention, already signed into contract with some of the major <coughs> oil corporations, is to frack Ukrainian uh, natural gas in order to take the place of the Russians who now supply a majority of the oil to the uh, to Europe. And uh, so we have essentially an oil war orchestrated by the American oil corporations. The United States is now training troops in the Ukraine and behind the headlines, leaving aside the U European Union US coup, which backed two fascist parties who took power in that country and who want to turn the resources over to American oil corporations <coughs> rather than the previous oligarchs. George Bush, in his heart, was a pacifist. He only orchestrated one war in Afghanistan. And by the way, Afghanistan is the world's largest source of rare earth metals, which are essential for computers. And they have every intention, even in the middle of the war, of continuing and taking over those resources. The United States, by the way, has become expert with private contractors, otherwise known as death squad private armies, to continue to exploit oil in the middle of a war. That's one of the reasons they got mad at ISIS, who they were very happy with when ISIS was fighting the Assad uh, government. But when ISIS started taking over U.S. oil wells, the United States said, you can't do that. That's not the rules of the game. Obama, on the other hand, has engaged in overt, seven overt wars since the Bush administration take o uh, uh, took over. He's the liberal Democrat, as well as countless um, drone wars across half of Africa and sanction wars privatized army death squad wars, the largest amount of torture ever <clears throat> all over the world, and, um, and uh, proxy wars, like in the case of Yemen today, where the U.S. provides the greatest four, uh, $3 billion a year to Saudi Arabia and provides the logistic intelligence for their slaughter of the people of Yemen. So war is an inherent part of capitalism. <coughs> Global warming is inherent in the functioning of the capitalist system. If you ask the ruling class whether or not they understand that continued wars over fossil fuels and their extraction at the rate they're doing spells doom for humankind, they essentially would say, yes, but we don't give a shit. Because unless we frack and poison the water and the air and heat the temperature, our competitors will do it instead of us. So we go to war over this fossil fuel. We build pipelines, like the XL Pipeline. And the only reason the XL Pipeline has been from Alberta tar sands to all the way down to Mexico has been stalled, has nothing to do with the environmental movement. It's because they found that with the reduction of the average per barrel cost of oil, it's not profitable to do this fracking process. But the um, Dutch have just come up with a new technology that makes fracking much cheaper. So they're resuming the fracking in Texas, which releases poison chemical, chemi uh, chemicals into the water supplies across the country because it's now more profitable or as profitable or close to as profitable to frack natural uh, shale and release the natural grass than it is <coughs> to use the traditional oil mechanisms. 
Stan mentioned that the Hollande government of France holds the record for deportation. President Obama has deported two million people, the largest number than all presidents of the United States in the modern era combined. President Obama, under his administration, has investigated 700,000 Muslims supposedly suspected of terrorism with like two convictions. President Obama has put all previous administrations to shame when it comes to civil liberties and surveillance. He now says that we are justified and can legally tap into everyone's computers, cell phones, and all other communications. And by the way, not just yours and ours, but a key is for American, for the CIA and uh, the National <coughs> Security Administration to tap into the computers of competing corporations. So as to steal their scientific advances in order to be more competitive in world markets, which is what drives this whole sick system that is the continued concentration of wealth and the lowered rate of profit has forced the ruling class to take it out on workers in every one and every aspect of their lives. So there are no, in the whole world, there are no Keynesian solutions. For those of you who don't know what that means, there are no government programs to create jobs uh, like in the 30s. There are no public works uh, massive bridge building and so on. The money that goes, goes directly to the capitalist class in order to bail them out. George Bush was a pauper, a miser, when it came to bailing out corporations. He only gave them one trillion dollars. Whereas Obama <laughs> bailed out the corporations to the tune of 30 trillion dollars since the beginning of his administration in order to keep the ship afloat. There's an article in today's business section of a revolutionary paper I read. It's called the New York Times. You guys heard of it in this city? And it says, many on Wall Street say it remains untamed. And your article says, um, the past several years have been filled with headline-grabbing legal settlements by financial services firms. 11 billion here, 5 billion there. That is the amount that the corporations, the Bank of America, uh, JP Morgan Chase, have been fined. That is, the, bank, the JP Morgan Chase is worth 4.3 trillion in assets, so they gave it a slap on the wrist and knocked off 5 billion. A tiny percentage, less than 1% of what they stole. It says, uh, most of them involved, that is these groups, uh, uh, that most of these people involved in conduct that took place before the 2008 crisis. Virtually every major Wall Street firm, now this is good news, has pledged to redouble its efforts to instill an ethical culture. You're supposed to be laughing when I say that. <laughs> And virtually all the large firms said that if there was bad behavior, it's behind them. And the New York Times comment was, well, it isn't. <laughs> and it goes on to say that when they did a survey last Tuesday, one third of the people who are making $500,000 a year or more annually said they have witnessed or have firsthand knowledge of wrongdoing in the workplace. And that's just one third. The other two thirds know that everybody lies, cheats, and steals on Wall Street. They just didn't put it down in their uh, questionnaire. It's very embarrassing. Do you lie, cheat, and steal? Me? No. But one third said it's, it's the rule. So there isn't a single aspect of this sick society that is untouched. We used to talk about the military industrial complex. They spend a trillion dollars a year on the military, but that's just a tiny part of it. Because when the United States gives Israel three billion and Saudi Arabia two or three billion, they don't give it to them in a check. They essentially take them to the Pentagon, select the weapons, and 
give the money to U.S. corporations who ships the weapons to Israel. And the money goes directly to the U.S. military. That's what foreign aid is. And that's not counted in the direct expenditures of the United States. All of the weapons that the United States sells, or in the form of aid, essentially are, represent additional billions of dollars. Today, we have 7.3 million people under the jurisdiction of the U.S. criminal justice system, half of whom are in prison, about 3.5 million. They are imprisoned in increasingly privatized, for-profit corporations who select the healthiest of the workers, sell them to the capitalists for agribusiness in the fields at an average rate of 50 cents an hour in the United States, with Georgia and Texas paying zero for prison labor. That's why they don't need the immigrants, because their wages of 7.25 an hour, if they get paid at all, Latinos, are much too high when you can hire slaves, majority black and Latino, in the prison industrial complex to work for virtually nothing. Every industry shows the corruption of capitalism at its base. There's the thickest book on that table by, by Thomas Piketty, the French economist, pointed out after studying the distribution of wealth of capitalism as a world system for 250 years, say it's inherent in the system that there is an unequal and increasingly unequal distribution of wealth. Well, just in the last period, 97% of all the new wealth created in the United States went to the 1%, with working people getting nothing, a decrease in their standard of living. They give figures for unemployment, for example, of 5.7%, but the, quote, actual participation in the labor force is about 65% which means 35% who are qualified to work don't. But they rig the statistics to give the impression they give part-time people and so on. They say every month in the New York Times when the Bureau of Labor Statistics says how many new jobs we create, they don't mention that the overwhelming percentage of those jobs are low-wage, service sector, no-benefit, non-union, slave labor type jobs. That's why young people are engaged in the fight for 15. And that's why Socialist Action has it on its front page. 60,000 people mobilized on May 15th, 5.15, for 15. So we live, <coughs> we live in a society which is racist to the core, increasingly imprisons its population, it go, participates in never-ending wars, destroys the environment, and no one denies it. No one denies it at all. We now know, if, if we, we should have known before, that what happened in Ferguson is what happened everywhere. Except they made a mistake in Ferguson. They showed some of the cops with armored personnel uh, carriers dressed in military fatigues and having high-power machine guns. But this is the norm everywhere. I have a comrade in Duluth, Minnesota, and he, was, he went unchallenged as a socialist. He was elected to the county board of supervisors, and they said, the United States government is going to give you in Duluth, which is a tourist town, a armored personnel carrier with machine gun on top for free. And he raised his hand and said, I'm against that. We don't need that in Duluth. And they said, if you don't take it, We'll cut off your federal aid to the state government for police and other things. So they forced them to take it. So this militarization of the police, which Obama said is embarrassed about, uh, is the norm everywhere. Police killings are the norm. There are new statistics that eight, every eight hours another unarmed black person is murdered in America. So we live in a period of incredible social tension and hatred of the evils fostered on everyone. In every aspect of the economy, this is this happened. 
Obama just gave the, what was it, Chevron, the right to frack the Arctic Circle. They didn't point out that he gave them the right. In 212, they put an oil rig the size of this building out there that was supposed to be invincible, and it got turned over by the ocean waves that reached 50 feet. They had to drag it ashore, and now the company swears they have made a better rig. So they're going to continue fracking in the most dangerous place in the world. <clears throat> they know that a fight back is coming. That's why they have surveillance for everybody. 1.3 million people have security clearance to spy on us. They wouldn't have a police state in formation going if they didn't know there was going to be a massive fight back in this country. They don't do it for their health. They are the most intelligent ruling class that has ever lived, and they fully expect the American working class to give an accounting of itself. What we've seen is the heat lightning. Thousands march in Ferguson, 3,000 miles away where I'm from, in Oakland, 10,000 kids, 40% black, 30% Latino, 20% Asian American, Arabs, Palestinians, all marched in solidarity with Ferguson. When you had 400,000 here on global warming, we had a quickie demonstration of 5,000 in Oakland with strongly anti-capitalist sentiments. So what is the alternative to this horror? The alternative is socialism. And I'm not going to go into great detail because I'm running out of time, but basically, if we lived in a socialist society, we could instantly transform most all of the fundamental problems. We just eliminate the military budget and bring all the troops home now from everywhere in the world and take the money and invest it in sustainable energy, free education, free housing, <clears throat> free education from the, the cradle to grave, reconstruction of the cities, 100% employment, technology would be used to shorten the working day with no cut in pay. In other words, the problem is not the lack of resources. We have enough resources absolutely right now to in an extremely short period of time fundamentally change the planet Earth and save it from disaster. And I don't need to go into this. The only question is, how do you get there? How do you make a socialist revolution? Well, I'll start with this. You can't make a socialist revolution unless you win over the majority of the working class to a revolutionary perspective. And to do that, you need a revolutionary party. So socialist action and our comrades in France and Greece are revolutionary parties. That means we don't think capitalism can be reformed. We don't think it's going to give way to an, a combination of the elections where the Greens and the Social Democrats are going to make capitalism a bit more kindler and gentler. So we seek to organize and mobilize the working class to take power. And we have confidence in that. If we didn't have confidence that workers would fight back, which in our view is the history of the planet Earth, the history of every nation on the planet is people fighting against the ruling class majority, whether it be slave society, feudal society, or capitalist society. The 1% don't represent us. So what is a revolutionary socialist party? Well, we're a good example. A revolutionary socialist party is a party that has, in its history, in its program, in its rank and file, an understanding of why capitalism cannot solve the problems of society and how to challenge capitalism. If you want to know how to cure cancer or heart disease or AIDS, you don't go to the person in the street, by the way, how do you cure cancer? You go to the institutions, the scientific institutions that embody the combined lessons of all of the experiments, trial and error, hypothesis accepted and rejected of all humankind to discover the cures to diseases. If you want to know how to change society, you go to the institutions that have assigned to themselves to be the equivalent 
of the scientific institution. Revolutionary parties carry with their cadre and their program and their history the lessons of all the struggles of humanity to fight for a better world, to transform this society into a revolutionary socialist society, to build for the first time in history a fighting party of the working class to challenge capitalist power and replace it with an organized institutional rule of the vast majority, which will be the first time in history that the majority directly controls society. So we have confidence that we can do that. We're a small party. We have confidence as the struggle heats up the many small socialist organizations, and they are very, very small today, will be put to the test of history. And those who can effectively mobilize people, who can raise their consciousness, who can engage them in united struggles, who can take all of the disparate social movements and combine them by winning their leadership and their ranks to the perspective that all of the individual problems, racism, poverty, unemployment, sexism, homophobia, endless war, global warming, all of this is a product of the capitalist society. It'll be a multiracial party that unites the independent black organizations and immigrant organizations and feminist struggles and pro-choice struggles and all others in a combined battle to challenge capitalism. Now, either you have to think you're looking at a nut who thinks that we can change the world, you know, a hopeless dreamer, but you're not because you came here to find out if there is an alternative to capitalism. And the only alternative is first to abolish it and then establish a society of majority rule. I'll close with this. Socialist Action's middle name is United Front. So it was we who played a critical role in building the United National Anti-War Coalition Conference in Secaucus last week, 400 people. The best we could do in these difficult times is call local actions against the never-ending imperialist wars. We built the demonstrations in Ferguson across the country. We mobilized our comrades in Oakland and in New York to participate and lead in Oakland the global warming protests. Everywhere workers are in struggle, everywhere they're on strike, everywhere they're challenging the trade union bureaucracy, everywhere they're questioning the corruption of the two-party system, our small cadre are there trying to win the best fighters to socialist revolution. That's our solution. That is the only alternative to capitalism, and the only alternative is to build a deeply implanted mass revolutionary party based in the working class in alliance with all the oppressed and capitalist rule once and for all. Thank you.